If you enjoy the content you get from In The Money Media, there's a few little things you can do to help us out. One, the easiest one, is to subscribe and like our various channels, the YouTube channel, becoming very popular. Also, our regular iTunes feed. Look for In The Money Media, like and subscribe. We would appreciate it. I mentioned elsewhere in the show, sign up for our free newsletter, best place to get all the content delivered right to your inbox, inthemoneypodcast.com slash email. And this is still a great time to sign up for In The Money Plus. We've got a lot of Kentucky Derby content coming down. Down the line, special podcasts, special articles, grid picks from all the in the money contributors. To learn more about that, in the money podcast.com slash plus competitively priced at $15 for the month. You are gonna earn out and then some the attrition rate on this service, very low. People like it, you'll like it too. If not, you can cancel at any time. In the money podcast.com slash plus. Next up on the show, we have a returning guest. We'd like to check in with him periodically during the Woodbine season, which is a back out. Well, let me start again because I'm not speaking in proper words. <laughs> Three, two, one. Next up, we have a returning guest. We like to check in with him several times throughout the Woodbine season, which kicks off this weekend. But we're not going to start there. We're going to start by talking to him about uh, a championship honor that he won last night at the Sovereign Awards from Woodbine. He's Jim Lawson. Jim, how are things? Things are great. I'm thrilled to be on the show again and really excited about getting started at Woodbine tomorrow. Yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be a, a, a proper full season after the last couple of years and what you guys have had to endure over there. But first, let's go back and talk about Mrs. Barbara winning that champion two-year-old Philly honor at the Sovereign Awards. What did that mean to you as somebody who's so involved in Canadian racing? Well, it, it meant a whole lot. I, I won't go through the entire story, but uh, her second dam was a horse that my dad bought in 1980 uh, named Eternal Search. Eternal Search went on to win three Sovereign Awards, uh, won 650000 was just a spectacular racehorse, won 17 stakes races, and... Uh, and then her one of her foals was a, a mare named Destroy, who has nine black type winners. Uh, Destroy was the brood mare of the year in Canada in 2010. I after my dad died, I desperately wanted to to keep this family going uh, without without success until lo and behold, this 22 year old mare Destroy shows up at Keeneland in 2019. Uh, she was pulled out of the sale because there was a, an, a, it ended up being an estate sale and I was desperate. And it, I went after the executors and bought a 22 year old mare. And uh, just to bring this mare back and retire in Canada. And lo and behold, she's carrying uh, a Bodie Meister filly uh, that ends up being named Canadian champion two year old filly last night. Um, it meant so much to me to, uh, to keep this family going that the, the the lineage has been there for 42 years, a great Canadian family. And, and so it was a very emotional night for me. I, uh, I took a brave step of naming the horse uh, after my mother, uh, who had died four years ago or a couple of years before the horse was born. So that's where the name came from, comes from. So you can imagine it was a special oh. night for me. A great family tribute in more than one sense of the word. That's so, so cool. And now I got to be careful here because we could go down a rabbit hole on this question. But it, I always love talking to you about your interest in the breeding industry. What do you got on the farm? What what, what do you have coming down the, the pipeline? I'll tell you, you mentioned Mrs. Barbara. Maybe before the maiden win in one of your appearances last year, I know there were several listeners who followed and have been following her and have, have cashed some tickets. Curious to know if you've got anything you're excited about uh, coming down the pike this year. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a, uh, a Liam's Map colt named Stronger Together, who's uh, one of the favorites for the Queen's Plate. He's in training in Lexington right now. We're excited about him. He's gained about 100 pounds. He was stakes place last year, and he fits well with the Canadian bred three-year-olds. So excited about him. And then uh, five 
two-year-olds, uh, including a half-brother to Mrs. Barbara that's training with Cassie in, uh, in Ocala. And Mark is excited about the two-year-old. His name is One for Chap. Uh, also named, that one's a family name too, named after my dad, who I nicknamed Chap. And then uh, got a, a Bolt Doro filly named Ghost Doro out of a Ghost Zapper mare that uh, is doing extremely well in Lexington. And she's going to Gail Cox. And um, and uh, then I've got three nice Colts that are going to sit at Tart. So uh, always hope springs eternal with two-year-olds, as you know. There, <laughs> But uh, reason to be excited ab uh, about uh, Stronger Together as a three-year-old and then uh, five nicely bred two-year-olds. So I'm, I'm excited about the year, in addition to being excited about Woodbine. That's fantastic. I promise we're getting to Woodbine next. But I have to ask you, I know your record breeding to first and second year sires is very good and identifying some of the under the radar ones without giving away the store. Is there a first year or second year sire you're particularly interested in that horse players might want to be paying attention to? Well, sure. I mean, listen, I, none of them are any secrets. Uh, you know, that I know, well, Bolt Doral's the first year sire this year in terms of racers. Um, and, and I'm always looking to, as you know, Peter, to try and look for that bargain. Uh, got one going to Silver State this year. Uh, Claiborne loves them. So, you know, there, there, are, there are a bunch of them out there. I've got a, a nice Matoli yearling. A lot of the Matolis are a little small, but I, I think they'll be runners. So um, there, there's, a, there's always lots of bargain shopping, I think. And, and you, have, you, you hold your breath for a couple of years and, and hope they come out runners. But uh, if you can get the confirmation right, the size right, uh, you know, these good runners like Matoli, they, they produce runners. So I'm excited. And those looking to follow Jim's horses, they run in his uh, gnome de course. It's Spruce Stable, right? Yeah, Spruce Stable or Spruce Spark Stable. I have a partner on uh, on some of them, yes. Excellent. Great stuff. Let's talk about Woodbine. You mentioned the Queen's Plate annually, one of the highlights of the meet. We'll get to that. But how happy are you to be starting on time in 2022? Well, I, I'm happiest again for our horse people. I mean, just the... The uncertainty the last couple of years, it's hard to get horses ready. It's hard to, so many of them are, are down south and they didn't know whether to ship north or not. And uh, the stakes program was up in the air right till, right till the very end. And, and this year, uh, everyone can plan. They're on their way in. Uh, we've got a, a, a great stakes program this year. And uh, it, uh, it should be a, another good year for Woodbine. Our, our brand is growing and our, our, the quality of our product. We've got lots of horses on the ground and uh, we'll be going full scale four days a week starting May the 12th. And uh, it, 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 we couldn't be in a better position right now. Racing Thursday through Sunday. Give us an idea of the racing schedule in these first couple of weeks. And then when you get back to your, your, your typical plan for the remainder of the meet. Yeah, uh, we're going uh, Saturday and Sunday, uh, starting tomorrow, of course, and then we'll do that again. And then we're going to three days, and then uh, the week of May 12th, we'll be at four days. Uh, we're going to run 133 days of live racing. We've got uh, $17 million stake schedule, and uh, it's, uh, it's just going to be a great year. We've got, uh, of course, uh, we'll come to it, I think, Peter, with the... The win in your end in September is, for me, the highlight of the year from a racing standpoint. And we've got those three grade one races on that one weekend on the turf in September. And uh, a, a, a lot of uh, uh, great program before that, including the Queen's Plate, which uh, that weekend will be a good prep race, prep races for those uh, races in September. We've built our program now. Uh, with the Queen's Plate being in August, which I think works well for the Canadian bred three-year-olds to get ready to go a mile and a quarter. So I'm really excited about uh, about where we're at. In terms of post times, when uh, do, do, is it? Are they established for throughout the meet? Are you, you going to be figuring that out, out as you go? I mean, I know they're they're traditional what 1 p.m. starts this weekend, but what's what do you have planned beyond that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we are, uh, you have to be nimble in this business. And I, I like the fact that we are nimble. Um, we're just looking at it now. Typically we would start, we would, we would start at, uh, at one on Thursdays and, and, uh, and often a twilight on Friday. 
uh, often to accommodate uh, TSN. We, we have a national racing show. That's all a little bit up in the air, but I know we are contemplating moving to twilight on Thursdays and Fridays for a waging perspective. Our, our, uh, our market study right now shows that uh, we are much more popular in the United States with those twilight cards. And uh, it mixes in well with the California card. So what uh, I, I expect we may be looking at uh, a twilight racing on both Thursdays and Fridays. And then, of course, the regular times on, uh, on Saturday and Sunday. We'll be looking to put together a nice plan promoting Woodbine. Nothing's finalized yet, but we're going to be covering it, I'm sure, as we have the last few years. So we'll keep listeners abreast of those post times and any special promotions that are going on as a result. You've mentioned the two big days I wanted to follow up with you about. Queen's Plate being run on a Sunday in August again, which I love because it gives me the opportunity to fly up, hopefully, Sunday morning and get there in person. Is this August, the August Queen's Plate was successful enough. Is this going to be the plan from here on out, or do you see it moving back to its traditional late June uh, date at, at some point? Well, at this time, we like where it's at. I, I, I always hesitate in this game to say, <laughs> never say never, but uh, given the success uh, from a wagering standpoint, field size, everything seemed to click uh, last August. And I, 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 uh, I'm very comfortable where it's at, uh, a little impacted of course, by the pandemic, we still had a number of our big trainers that didn't go to Florida, uh, or new Orleans this year as, as they normally would. So, um, this will give them the extra time, but my sense is that people are really happy with the August date. And, uh, in terms of Sunday, uh, we also think Sunday's a, a good date. We have, we'll have it to ourselves, so to speak. And uh, we, we get some of those jockeys uh, coming up from uh, Saratoga at that time. So it, that, uh, that certainly helps uh, the day and the betting in the United States. The other thing is that, uh, you know, in, in a, we have, we've been so successful, the Ontario breeders selling in Kentucky and there I'm hearing, you know, in addition to Messier, but you're, I'm hearing of any number of Ontario breads that are popping up with a lot of promise right now racing in the United States. So um, it'll give them time to come up here and get acclimatized, uh, maybe for the for the uh, for the plate trial, which is the same day as the Canadian Oaks uh, in, in July. Which, and, and that is going to be a great day, too, where you're going to be. I, I like the way the calendar, it's going to be feeding into the big days, all feeding into each other. It'll definitely give us a great opportunity to focus our coverage so folks can, you know, you know, we, we encourage you and a lot of people we have are playing Woodbine week in, week out. But even if you're you're going for the big days, you can really focus and follow those weekends and come out with knowledge that's going to help you cash some tickets, which I know is what our audience is, is all about. So I, well, I love it, 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 yeah. that's exactly right. Uh, and they get, and they get to become familiar with the horses. You know, I, I'm, I'm just talking off the top of my head here, but when you think about July 24th in, 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 in Canada and the Canadian uh, Oaks that day in the, in the play trial, one thing that, that has definitely evolved and it, it may, you know, my only, uh, thought on it is that given the lower breed numbers and the lower number of horses in Canada, the, the fillies are every year extremely competitive for the Queen's Plate. So the Woodbine Oaks on July 24th is a major stepping stone and prep race into the Queen's Plate. Uh, uh, and, it, and it has been. We, the fillies have been very successful. So what, what's so great about that weekend with the plate trial and the Oaks is the two races go a mile and an eighth back to back. And usually the, the girls run faster. So what that does is the owner of the filly says, oh, boy, we got to give it a try now. We just ran a couple ticks quicker than the boys. And so it's, it, it sets up the, the Queen's Plate almost for a girls versus boys uh, and that's the way it's been in the last few years, which is which is pretty fun.
Yeah, that's definitely been a key form line. It's a great, uh, a great storyline to follow as well. And then with the plate and the undercard stakes on that day, setting up beautifully for the weekend with the three grade ones. Talk about key form lines, the summer, the Natama, the Woodbine Mile, all tying in to the Breeders' Cup, uh, it seems, year in, year out. And I'll tell you what, that's a weekend. If you're thinking of traveling, if you're a horse player who wants to check out Woodbine, First of all, it's a it's a great facility. Uh, we've had a lot of great days up there, not in a couple of years. Really looking forward to get back. But that's a weekend I'd say highlight it because of several reasons. Great racing. Uh, the weather in Toronto in September. I mean, you know, I hope not jinxing it here, but usually phenomenal. And very, now I hope this will be the case again this year, but very easy sell to the non-racing partner because you've also got the Toronto Film Festival going on typically at the same time. So circle those days on your calendar. Who knows? Maybe at some point I, I can convince you guys to get a contest back on the calendar as well. Wouldn't that be fun? And yeah. uh, it, it's it's a, a great weekend to, to think about heading up north and, and definitely one, one to look forward to. Do you know that the date offhand, Jim, for the Woodbine Mile this year? Oh sure, I'm I'm just I'm just checking, but it's uh, the the sixteenth or it's the seventeenth. It'll be Saturday the seventeenth, and uh, yes, the Toronto Film Festival, which is one of the great film festivals in the world now. And uh, for those who aren't the film going types, a lot of a big crossover between uh, horse racing and baseball. And I expect the Yankees are going to be in a pennant race right about then with the Blue Jays. So let's let's hope I'm right on that too. <laughs> You know, I've still never been to a Blue Jays game. May have to correct that injustice this year as well. Jim, so great having you on. We'll have you back periodically to, to you know, what we did last year was great. We'd have you on early in the week of the big weeks. You give us the lay of the land. Let us know how the the, the owning and breeding operation is going. And, and who knows, if it all goes right, maybe you can look to go back to back in the Sovereign Awards. Great <laughs> having you on air here today, my friend, and I look forward to chatting soon. Thrilled to be on. Look forward to talking again soon. Take care and all the best. Cheers, Jim. Speaking of Woodbine, our next guest works there. We sometimes talk about things related to Woodbine, but mostly we talk about the JRA races that happen on uh, Saturday nights. Very excited to welcome back to the show, Klaus Ebner. Klaus, how are things? Good, Pete. How are you? I'm doing great. Let's start with the let's start with the the, the day job, as it were. Uh, how excited are you to have, as you said off air, Woodbine starting uh, for the first time in a couple of years on the day when it's actually supposed to start? Yeah, it's, you know, I think for all of us, we're kind of just uh, breathing a bit of a sigh of relief. You know, let's just let's just get it started. Uh, and we'll kind of work from there towards, you know, our, our big days in the air being the Queen's Play, Woodbine Mile. Um, you know, obviously the harness is still going strong, so we'll continue to push forward there on the Mohawk side. But yeah, no, it's just... Um, you know, I, I'm back into work on, on Saturday to kind of welcome some of our fans back for opening day. So, uh, you know, what? Uh, you know, a part of me is just like, you know, that's cool. Cause it kind of just, you know, you get that kind of feeling going in you and you're just like, you know what, nothing like going to a racetrack, uh, and it being your home racetrack and the one you've grown, grown up with to, uh, just kind of restart racing for the year. And these are always, you know, positive things for everyone. Right. Absolutely. And I'm glad you mentioned Harness. I don't plug enough on this show the fact that we have a sister show that covers Mohawk pretty extensively and the Harness world in general. A uh, first over with Edison Hatter. He's doing a great job. Subscribe to that on iTunes if you're interested in standard breads. And, and I'll say this if you don't, if you're not aware of what the pools look like up there, um, this is stuff that a thoroughbred player even if you've never played harness racing before, it's worth checking out, I think, to see if it captures your fancy because there's some real money being bet and some real opportunities. I know, Klaus, you follow racing all around the world. I, I assume you've got uh, some some standard bread chops as well. Well, I don't know if we, if we spoke about this, Pete, but uh, I actually own harness horses. So, oh. uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, in terms of the handicapping side, I can't say I'm not great. You know, I leave that to Robert Reed and those people that, you know, and it is some that's uh, – really can handicap the game. Uh, I, you know, I bet on my own horses. I bet on, on harness racing the big days. But, uh, you know, on, on the owning side, like, yeah, if you're an owner, uh, harness is really way, the way to go, in, in my opinion, in, in horse racing because, you know, your horses run every week for the most part, right? So you have a chance to earn a paycheck every, you know, you can run four times in a month, five times in a month sometimes, if you pay on how many days you have in the month. So uh, the opportunity is there to at least, you know, pay, pay for themselves if you're a harness owner, that's for sure. 
a lot of action and, uh, and, and a lot of fun and a chance to cash some checks. Let's talk about your stated purpose on the show. The JRA race is Saturday night. Folks can get much more coverage on the day, typically late afternoon on a Saturday over at InTheMoneyPodcast.com. You'll have the opportunity to get free past performances as well as analysis from Klaus and the team. What do we have to look forward to this Saturday? Yeah, so this Saturday, Pete, is the uh, the running of the 2000 Japanese 2000 Guineas, the Satsuki Show. Um, yeah, so we want to talk quickly about the wagering side is uh, we do have a high five carryover. That's for the big race, so we get the uh, top five horses in the race. Um, just because last week the favorites, uh, and we'll get into that a little bit with this race, but the favorites last week just uh, you know they didn't really show per se. We had a 15 to one over a six to one over a 15 to one shot. That was, those are the three finishers in the race. That just shows you what can happen in Japan with you know the field being wide open. I think it's the same in this case uh, in this event this this weekend. Uh, you know there are a few if you, if you want to call them hype horses coming in, um, and it's interesting because the hype horses you know at least I feel uh, in the form of Equinox and a horse called uh, Desierto both drew into post sixteen and eighteen. So this is very reminiscent of last week, uh, where two of the top choices were also drawn in sixteen and eighteen. Uh, both of those horses, you know, yeah, they fired their shot, but uh, you know, didn't didn't win the race. Uh, and sure enough, yet again, we have two of the sort of more preferred horses on the, on the very far outside of the field. You know, it is a, a two turn race, so I don't think it'd be more as much of a concern. But um, especially in the form of Equinox, eighteen is a pretty bad post. You know, I think there was one winner from eighteen in the past uh, ten years, so it's not impossible. Much like the, the we had, you know, sort of those weird posts. But uh, you know, for us, it's it's just a case of trying to figure it out and, and diving into the mess and just, just to find out a winner there. But yeah, it's a very competitive field uh, in, in the form of Desierto. This horse could be a freak. I saw his training video this past week and I've never seen this before in, in Japanese racing or at least in the sort of workout videos. Because, you know, I, I follow another, another, another gentleman called uh, Graham Pavey, long ball to know one, those of you that don't know on Twitter. Uh, he posts a lot of the workout videos for these horses coming to these races. I like, I like seeing them, you know, do I kind of, judge everything off these workout uh, videos no but uh, it's good to kind of see and get a gauge in terms of who's coming into the race in the right way much like you would for derby or any sort of event looking for you know horses that are you know on, on the right side of the fitness uh, peak if you will and this horse is really uh, is a freak uh, he really in this in, the, in his training video I've never seen this before uh, the exercise rider was actually standing up in his stirrups holding the reins while this horse was just blitzing down the course. And it wasn't uncontrolled. It was just, you know, a horse doing his work. And he finished up his last for, uh, last workout very quickly. So like I said, this horse could be a freak. I don't know what sort of odds you'll see on him. You know, he's three for three. He made his turf debut last time out, uh, one by two lengths. Uh, he's by De Dre Fong. So that's why he started his career on the dirt. Uh, but then when his listed stakes company at debut last time out in mile and a quarter, three for three. So yeah, it's caught everyone's attention. But, you know, for my selections, Pete, I'm going to go to the inside horses. There's, there are a few horses on the inside. Um, we'll start with one and the horse through the rail. So not that great, but you know, I, I think that's, that's fine. Uh, that's a horse called Den on Beluga. Um, two for two for this one, uh, did win the, uh, grade three Kyoto news high last time out, uh, some son of hearts cry and have a Tisway mare. So I don't see this horse having any sort of issue, uh, with mile and a quarter, uh, should sit the perfect trip in behind horses. And, uh, if good enough has you know, every, every chance to, to make it, you know, a winning effort here. Uh, another one looking at is a horse that's really undefeated and also raising a lot of buzz. And that's a horse called ask Victor Moore. Uh, so by a deep impact out of a rainbow quest mare. So another one that truly shouldn't have any issue with uh, distance uh, two for two at, uh, you know, uh, races that are from 1800 to, uh, to a mile and a quarter, which is, you know, so we'll say mile and eighth to, to, to a mile and a quarter. And the most important, important thing for me that I like about Asperger Moore Moore is, is this horse is three for three at the race course being Nakidama. Uh, he didn't win one of the main, main preps for this, that being the uh, Yayoi show uh, beating Do Deuce, who was the two-year-old uh, horse of the year last year. So As Victor Moore has gone from strength to strength, uh, you know, and, and has made really 20, 2022 his own so far, winning both of his races, including that prep. Uh, he likes Nakayama, and I think a, a big shot in here. And you know, another horse that's uh, it, it's sort of on the inside as well that I, I really do like, uh, and that's a, a horse in the form of uh, Killer Ability. Uh, another uh, ton of deep impact. Uh, so those of you who don't know, don't know, this may be one of the last chances for Deep Impact. Uh, he passed away 
a couple of years ago, 2019, I believe. So we're starting to see the very last of his crops, and that's very sad to see, but it's just the sad reality of everything with life. Uh, this horse won the hopeful stakes as a two-year-old. So this is he's really making his three-year-old debut. And, you know, those of you saying, well, hey, you know, is that a bad thing? Well, not necessarily. We have seen horses come back from winning the hopeful to win this event, uh, one being Contrail, for instance. So he came, he went from the hopeful stakes to the Satsuki show route with no issues. Uh, another one who's won at Yakiyama, he won the hopeful at the same course and distance uh, as a two-year-old. And really one that I think has more than enough room to improve. Uh, it is by the American bred killer graces, who's the mayor of my Congaree. So another who should really enjoy the, uh, the mile quarter. So yeah, Pete, uh, just to summarize everything, uh, if this race is pretty wide open. It sounds great. It sounds like it's going to be one to definitely be paying attention to. It should be an important form line going forward. Again, you're going to have full picks and analysis on in the money podcast.com on Saturday, but just want to ask you, and if you don't have an answer to this, that's fine. I didn't prep you for it, but you know, you mentioned that carryover in the super high five. Do you have any advice on wagering strategy for a bet like that in a race that's this open? So you're right. So what I what I normally do in in the pick fives myself. So there, there's two forms of of reference here. So the early races are tougher than the, the late races in Japan. So we do have two pick fives. We have the early one starting in, in in the first race, then we also have the late one starting in race eight, which kind of covers off all your stakes races. So the late one, if we're looking at the late pick five, it's going to be a lot more formful. So what I tend to do is I'll go one or two deep in races eight, nine, ten. Uh, and then I'll spread a lot. I, and in this case here, just because this race is wide open, I'm going to spread a lot in this race and kind of cover my bases with, you know, four to five horses. So I may do a, you know, like a two by two by, you know, a two by two by three by five by one or two in the last race. So that's usually what I would do in these sort of races myself to kind of keep my ticket at a lower, a lower uh, cost. And the, the bonus we do have is the fact that there is a 20 cent min on these pick fives. So you're allowed to invest, you know, you can get more combinations for a smaller amount. And, you know, last week for 20 cents, for instance, because we had such, you know, disparity in payouts, if you want to call it that, um, there's, a, there's a, you know, the, last, the late pick five last week paid over $8,000, for instance, for a 20 cent payout. So not bad at all. Again, if you provide, if you can find the right combinations, but that's usually what I do in these cases, Pete, uh, in the early pick five, for instance, for, for when we draw on JRA, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I had a $800 ticket for $14 for a, for a pick five. So it's not, again, it's, it's, we know the pool sizes we're trying to, obviously we're working our best, obviously you and I, and everyone trying to promote Japan racing to, you know, get people to play these pools and increase these pool sizes. That's what we want at the end of the day. Um, so the early races may not be as, as, as heavy, if you will, their pool sizes may not be as, as strong as we would like, but you can still get paid pretty, pretty, you know, pretty well for if, if your, your you know, opinions are correct. Good stuff. We appreciate your insights. Again, we'll look for more over at InTheMoneyPodcast.com and we'll have you on again soon, class. And one thing, Pete, before I let you go, Please. I do want to, I, I, you did bring a bit of a tear to my eye when I saw that you picked uh, Crown Pride as part of your derby, uh, your derby <laughs> draft. So thank yeah. you for that. Uh, I, I, I sent you a big heart for that one. And, uh, you know, yeah, you got my level with that pick at least. Clearly the choice at that point in the in the draft and a horse that there's going to be a lot more to talk about. I've probably done more digging on that speed figure than on any race I've ever looked at. I've gotten great information from analysts all over the world. And it all comes down to the idea that it's a really, really hard race to make a figure for. But there's a case to be made that it's not too far out of what it might take to at least be uh, competitive in a race like the Derby. But we'll talk about that on other shows, my friend. I'm glad you appreciated that. That one was for you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Pete. Have a good weekend.